Well, hello. Welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another episode of what I hope is your favorite public affairs TV show. Uh, we are actually going to go right in the middle of uh, picking up from where we left off last week. Last week, we started pretty much a series. Uh, I didn't realize when I was doing last week's uh, show prep that we were going to be doing a series, but we are. Uh, this is part two of How Did We Get Here? A Guide to Understanding the Middle East Conflict. Uh, last week we started off around 1974 and 1975. We discussed the Kurdish independence movement, the rise of Saddam Hussein in Iraq and uh, Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini in uh, Iran, the Iran-Iraq War, the chemical weapons on uh, Halabja. Today, April 14th, happens to be the 31st anniversary of Operation El Dorado Canyon, which we had covered last week, which was the U.S. bombing of uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. We're not going to rehash that. We've already covered that. But what we did was brought you through the timeline of Middle Eastern events. And yes, we did touch briefly on the Iran-Contra affair, and we did briefly touch on the Beirut bombing uh, in 1983. Uh, there's, of course, w with so many different regional interests, so much going on, and yet we've got a linear timeline that we're trying to keep uh, you know, keep moving forward on. So yes, there's a lot that I am not discussing, a lot that I am not covering. We're taking the 30,000 foot overview just to be able to walk you through all of these events to see how they lead us up to what's going on in the region today, especially where American involvement in these issues are concerned. So with that, we are actually going to take a look at today's Prager University segment titled, Why America's Military Must Be Strong. From when America's armed forces entered World War I in 1917 until today, the United States military has repeatedly made the difference between civilization and barbarism. It's no exaggeration to say that a militarily strong America is the one indispensable prerequisite for a peaceful and prosperous world. The witness of history, as well as our own common sense, bears testament to the fact that when America's armed forces are powerful, focused and feared, the globe is a better place than when she is weak, unprepared and vacillating. In the past century alone, there have been four great threats made to peace, democracy and freedom. Each of them have come from enemies that hate and fear what the United States stands for, as laid down in her Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and Bill of Rights. Three of these have come from differing mutations of fascism, and one from its totalitarian twin, communism. In each case, it has been the US military that has been a principal force protecting the free world from the tyranny these threats have sought to impose. The First World War sprung from Germany's bid for hegemony over Europe and was powered by a Prussian military machine that was proto-fascist in its outlooks, ambitions and assumptions. When the discovery of the infamous Zimmermann telegram revealed that Germany wanted to extend the war even into the American heartland, the Wilson administration sent hundreds of thousands of young American recruits, nicknamed Doughboys, onto the battlefields of Europe and tipped the balance in the Allies' favor. 25 years later, the American armed forces were again fighting against the second mutation of fascist ideology as espoused by Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. On battlefields as distant from America as tiny islands in the South Pacific, picturesque villages in Italy and desolate towns in Northern Africa, as well as on the sea in the Atlantic and in the skies over Germany, the American armed forces made another invaluable contribution to victory. Yet the fight for freedom wasn't over. Almost as soon as World War II ended, a new threat arose, the red fascist version of totalitarianism, Soviet communism. It soon cast its shadow over Eastern Europe as well as parts of Africa, Asia and Latin America. American military might, deployed intelligently and globally, played the key role in neutralizing and then ultimately bankrupting that terrible menace to the free world. 
When victory in the Cold War in the late 1980s and early 1990s finally came under the presidencies of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, it was because the US armed forces were kept strong enough to deal with the ceaseless probing and provocations of the Soviet Union over nearly half a century. Since 9-11, the world has been faced with yet another mutation of fascism, fundamentalist Islamist terrorism. Taking on many of the features of earlier fascist movements, hatred of democracy and Christianity, a fanatical anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism, and a desire for utter uniformity, the Islamist terror movement has caused death and destruction wherever it has appeared. The fascist bacillus has mutated yet again, but it is alive and well. And yet again, the traditional antidote to the American military has taken up the task. By taking on the forces of terror in full-scale wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the US made it clear that it would not permit fascism to triumph in our time, any more than earlier generations of Americans permitted it to in theirs. All this has come at great cost in lives and money. The cost of these precious lives, men and women fighting for others' freedom far from their own homes, can never be repaid. But the money, a defence budget that is by far the largest in the world, has been well spent. It has protected the honour, power and prestige of the USA, upon which the cause of freedom ultimately relies. When the United States armed forces are weak as they were before the Second World War, when America had only the 14th largest army in the world, the likes of Adolf Hitler are encouraged to make larger and larger demands. When US armed forces are strong, however, even a superpower like the Soviet Union has to acknowledge its own internal contradictions and inability to overawe the West. With China rearming massively and posing a growing threat to Western interests and values around the world, and the threat of Islamist fascism still upon us, it is well to learn the central lesson of the past half century of human experience, which is that for her own sake, and that of those who love freedom everywhere, the United States must be militarily preeminent. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. So there you have it. The American military must be strong because of the precedent we set with World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. But now, Take a look at what we discovered, or what we discussed last week about Ronald Reagan's use of force in the Middle East and his influence in the region. We did not have a full-scale conflict. Yes, we had a limited strike against Libya. We had a naval presence and Marine Corps presence in Lebanon. And that was back when Lebanon and Israel and the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, were all you know, flaring up in their little conflicts. So we were there more in a peacekeeping role, but we weren't there in an invasion type capacity. We were not there in a shooting build up hostility. We were there trying to keep the peace between two sides or three sides. Reagan did not want a full scale war. Yes, you can argue that that was kind of that way with Grenada. Grenada, as we know, it was largely a diversion to take the bad press, uh, bad headlines away from what was going on in Lebanon with the Beirut bombing, um, the Marine Corps barracks that was bombed in uh, October of 1983. It was a little bit of a diversion, but Again, this was not the United States going to war with a major country, a major entity. That was Reagan's doctrine. That's why we had Iran-Contra. Iran-Contra was trying to get our diplomatic solutions, our military operations done without you know, having a major confrontation. Yeah, we were doing some stuff uh, through covert operations. Uh, trying to destabilize Iran. Remember, we had the Iran hostage crisis, which we also talked about last week. So all of this has been going on, but Ronald Reagan did not want to have a full-scale war. He was trying to avoid that at all costs. Then, Ronald Reagan leaves office January 20th, 1989. George Herbert Walker Bush takes over. 
and right after that we had the fall of the Berlin Wall. That was when the Soviet Union was broken up shortly thereafter. A lot of that was because of the policies of Ronald Reagan, essentially forcing the Soviets to spend more than their ability to generate the income. And so with the economic decline in Russia and the breaking apart of the Eastern Bloc countries in Europe, things were starting to kind of get shaken out after a protracted Cold War after World War II. But then what happened on August 2nd? This is how we ended the show last week. By the way, our archives are on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, if they're not on YouTube, they are on Facebook and, and vice versa. Uh, YouTube.com slash North Star Oasis and Facebook.com slash North Star Oasis. And for Facebook, please go to our channel, like our page, watch some of our back as episodes, especially last week's. It was, you know, very important to set the stage for where we're at in today's episode. Because August 2nd, 1990, that's when we went back to war. When we had a full-scale buildup in the Middle East because Saddam Hussein had the Iraqi army, the Republican Guard, overrun the country of Kuwait. So we're going to give you more of an encapsulated timeline of Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm because I could spend probably a good two or three months just discussing what was going on at that period of time. We're only going to cover it here in about five minutes or ten minutes. So let's take a look at the timeline of Operation Desert Storm. Saddam Hussein called this the mother of all battles. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be learning more about the Persian Gulf War. Should military action be required, this will not be another Vietnam. This will not be a protracted, drawn-out war. Relations between the United States and Iraq were strained for years due to Iraq's alliance with the Soviet Union during the Cold War and their stance on other world conflicts. Despite this, the U.S. helped Iraq in the war against Iran during the 1980s. While this battle helped build Iraq into an important power, it also left the country broke. In addition, Iraq's economy suffered because of low oil prices they blamed on overproduction by Kuwait. In July 1990, Saddam Hussein's regime threatened military action should they continue. Saddam also hoped to erase the debt his country owed Kuwait after the Iran-Iraq war. He wished to expand Iraq's presence in the Middle East by controlling Kuwait's huge oil reserves and by annexing the whole country. Due to the region's history, he already considered Kuwait as part of Iraq. The neighboring countries failed to find a compromise, so Iraq launched a surprise invasion of Kuwait on August 2, 1990. Saddam claimed victory within a couple of days. Meanwhile, the United Nations hoped for a quick and diplomatic end to this occupation. Iraq refused a UN request to withdraw, so the country was put under a total trade embargo. At this point, the United States under George H.W. Bush worried that by invading Kuwait, Iraq had gained easier access to neighboring Saudi Arabia and its vast oil reserves. The U.S. hoped to contain Iraqi influence and prevent Saddam's regime from controlling the majority of the world's oil. On August 7th, the U.S. and a coalition of Western allies deployed troops to Saudi Arabia in a mission called Operation Desert Shield. This military action was based on an earlier plan created by the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command, General Norman Schwarzkopf, otherwise known as Storm and Norman. In November, the U.N. gave Iraq a deadline of January 15th to withdraw from Kuwait, otherwise the coalition would be permitted to respond with force. Until January, the U.S.-led coalition presence in the region grew to include soldiers from 34 countries, including Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, and Egypt. This group was led by Schwarzkopf. On January 16, 1991, when Saddam's military remained in Kuwait, Operation Desert Storm began. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. Coalition forces had a significant technological lead over their opponents, so this aerial offensive saw the demolition of Iraq's air support as well as much of its infrastructure and important buildings. Iraq responded tactically by attacking Israel with Scud missiles. Saddam assumed he could cripple the coalition with this move because Israel had a policy of retaliation. 
He knew that Arab nations in the coalition would never fight alongside Israel. And so, if he was able to bring them into the fray, he would also be forcing those various Arab countries to leave the coalition. However, President Bush convinced Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir not to respond. Iraq continued its missile attack, while the coalition initiated the war's ground phase in an attempt to liberate Kuwait. Operation Desert Sabre saw coalition forces move from Saudi Arabia to Kuwait and finally to Iraq. Though the ground forces of both sides were seen as relatively equal, the Iraqi stronghold collapsed within a few days. On February 28, 1991, President Bush announced the end of hostilities. Kuwait is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. Iraq agreed to acknowledge Kuwait as a distinct nation and to rid itself of weapons of mass destruction. However, Iraq failed to fully cooperate with those directives. This eventually led to the invasion of Iraq by the United States under George W. Bush in 2003 and the ensuing Iraq War. 1991's relatively short Gulf War resulted in significant Iraqi civilian and military deaths and fewer than 400 coalition military casualties. However, as many as 250,000 of the almost 700,000 coalition soldiers who served developed an illness called Gulf War Syndrome, purportedly due to the use of chemical weapons. This was one of the first wars to be covered live by television media. Because of this and its impact on world history, the significance of the Gulf War resonated well into the 21st century. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the political things that were going on behind Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm. The thing that a lot of people ask, and, and I still have questions, honestly, is that when Saddam Hussein and his army overran Kuwait and made a play on Saudi Arabia, uh, a few days after that happened, on August 2nd, 1990, President George H.W. Bush went in front of the TVs and said to, in, in, in front of the camera and said to everybody, we're here for a defensive posture only. At the same time, we end up getting into a shooting war. And this is where I think, in hindsight, I think a lot of Republicans and Democrats might actually agree. Was it worth it? Um, I think the jury's still going to be out on that. Why did we have to be in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Iraq? Um, that's definitely been a departure from the Reagan doctrine. The Reagan doctrine would have sent peacekeepers in uh, pretty much at the Saudi border and said, that's it, you're not going any further, and as soon as we can keep the peace, we're sending our people home. That's how Reagan would have handled it. At least that's how Reagan had handled situations like that during his presidency. With George H.W. Bush, on the other hand, we ended up perpetuating a shooting war. And in deference to President Bush, the elder, uh, his whole thing was to keep it to a limited engagement. Keep in mind, this is somebody who was cap almost captured during World War II. Uh, during President George H.W. Bush's uh, Navy career, he soloed his first solo flight as a pilot was at the Navy training field, which is now the 934th Airlift Wing Air Force Reserve at the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. So George H.W. Bush soloed here, and then he had a Navy career and uh, became a fighter pilot and was almost captured at Chichijima. So George H.W. Bush has gone to war, he's seen war, he came close to losing his life in war, and the one thing I have to say for him is that he did not want to see that escalate into something bigger than the limited focus in which he had called to arms. That was to, he had a, he had a four point plan, but of that four point plan, part number one was mainly to drive the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. But then after that, what happened? It became more protracted. But before we do that, we're going to show you some footage from the U-2 spy plane in Operation Desert Storm. 
Operation Desert Storm started when Iraq refused to withdraw its forces from Kuwait by January 15, 1991. On January 16, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, President George H.W. Bush announced that the Allied offensive against Iraq had begun. With the start of the air war, the U-2's operations switched from a peacetime airborne reconnaissance program to emergency reconnaissance operations. Most of the missions were carried out by the 1704th Reconnaissance Squadron Provisional. U-2s tracked Iraqi troops and armory buildups, assessed bomb damage, and even monitored a massive oil spill in the Persian Gulf. The U-2 was able to provide approximately 90% of the Army's targeting intelligence, 50% of all imagery intelligence, and 30% of the total intelligence for the war. In the six weeks of Desert Storm, the U-2 flew 260 sorties for more than 2,022 hours averaging over 43 sorties and 337 hours per week. So that is what the U-2s were doing. They were monitoring the situation from the air. I wanted to at least show something operational from Operation Desert Storm. Now, going back to the politics behind it, find this quite fascinating. We've heard George H.W. Bush talking about the New World Order. Well, let's take a look at a speech and note the date, September 11th, 1991, a joint session of Congress. Until now, the world we've known has been a world divided, a world of barbed wire and concrete block, conflict, cold war. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. In the words of Winston Churchill, a world order in which the principles of justice and fair play protect the weak against the strong. A world where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders a world in which freedom and respect for human rights find a home among all nations. The Gulf War put this new world to its, its first test. And my fellow Americans, we passed that test for the sake of our principles, for the sake of the Kuwaiti people. We stood our ground because the world would not look the other way Ambassador El Saba, tonight, Kuwait is free. Where is it? We are very happy about that. Tonight, as our troops begin to come home, let us recognize that the hard work of freedom still calls us forward. We've learned the hard lessons of history. The victory over Iraq was not waged as a war to end all wars. Even the New World Order cannot guarantee an era of perpetual peace, but enduring peace must be our mission. Our success in the Gulf will shape not only the new world order we seek, but our mission here at home. In the war just ended, there were clear-cut objectives, timetables, and above all, an overriding imperative to achieve results. We must bring that same sense of self-discipline, that same sense of urgency, to the way we meet challenges here at home. In my state, we have to do in the future. To protect our so, victory over Iraq. That's what it seems like at that time. It wasn't a victory. Perpetual versus enduring. Let's see, a definition of perpetual. Uh, 
lasting forever, never ending, continuing or being so for an indefinitely long time, uh, eternal, permanent. So there, we're trying to create a permanent peace, long-lasting peace. That didn't happen. Um, let's see, enduring, uh, surviving, permanent. You know, here, President George H.W. Bush is talking about perpetual versus enduring. They're both the same. They're both the same, and what he's trying to do is say, we've got a long and lasting peace because we kicked the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. Keep in mind that George H.W. Bush is still looking at the world through the lens of World War II and the Cold War. Keep in mind the uh, Eastern Bloc countries had just fallen apart. The um, Soviet Union was breaking apart. And so things were changing, and that was the new world order, is the Cold War was coming to a close. And here we are, going back to why America's mili American military must be strong, is that we in his mind at that time, succeeded in not creating the same type of strife that was created during the Cold War, World War II, World War I, and we were standing up to an aggressor nation. That was really what George H.W. Bush was all about. We were standing up for the rights of free people around the world. Um, what happened? We left a containment force. And then President George H.W. Bush lost the 1992 election. In comes President Bill Clinton, who gave us the uh, Operations Northern and Southern Watch to monitor a no-fly zone over the country of Iraq, which, because Saddam Hussein was still in power, he was testing that all the time. Always testing the no-fly zone. So we ended up sending in a missile attack. And let's take a look at the video on President Clinton defending his decision. We have to do in the future to protect our pilots and to protect their ability. To... What we have done is to show that we are prepared to change the strategic. I am uh, pleased to report that according to uh, the information I've received from Secretary Perry today, uh, the airstrikes, uh, the missile strikes that were conducted over the last two days have been successful. Uh, the targets were either destroyed or sufficiently damaged so that we can say that our mission has been achieved. Uh, that made it possible for us to implement the expanded no-fly zone today. And I want to commend uh, the military once again for the exceptional job they have done in carrying out this mission. Now, what has happened is that this has changed the strategic situation, particularly in the southern part of Iraq, which Saddam used as a staging ground for his invasion of Kuwait, and then in 1994 for the massing of his troops near the Kuwaiti border. Uh, he is strategically worse off than he was before these strikes began, and I am satisfied that this was an appropriate measured response. Uh, obviously, uh, we can't predict entirely what uh, Saddam Hussein will do, but now he knows that there is a price to be paid for stepping over the line that the United Nations resolutions impose. Wait, and then in 1994 for the massing of his troops near the Kuwaiti border. I have received the reports of the explosions. I do not know anything about them. I can tell you that they uh, are not the product of any action that we have taken. I don't think it's dead. I think uh, quite to the contrary. We have received uh, good support from, uh, from the British. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada called me last night. Uh, the German Chancellor issued a strong statement. Uh, I think that uh, our Arab partners clearly understand what we were doing and what the risks are. Uh, we're still flying uh, the no-fly zone out of bases in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I think things are on track, and I feel, uh, I feel good about it. This was uh, an action that I thought we had to take. 
It was a measured, strong, appropriate action, and I believe we did the right thing. Mr. President, yes. The military, once again, for the exceptional job they have. Uh, there was a, a fixing on one of our planes that occurred uh, from a site north of the 33rd parallel, but uh, it does not. We believe we can fly this expanded no-fly zone now. It gives us a, an attempt to measure, uh, or it gives us the capacity, excuse me, to measure what he's doing all the way up to uh, the southern suburbs of Baghdad. See the good support from, uh, from the British. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada called me. Okay, now let me back up just a, a second to provide a little bit of context here. Right after Operation Desert Storm ended, before George H.W. Bush gave his New World Order speech, when General H. Norman Schwarzkopf had uh, agreed to the terms of surrender of the, uh, of the Iraqi army, the Iraqis asked him if they can use helicopters, and he kind of said, well, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that. He wasn't thinking military helicopters. He wasn't thinking about helicopters for an offensive campaign. And the Iraqi government took advantage of that and launched strikes against their own people to the Shia in the south and to the Kurds in the north. That was what helped precipitate the no-fly zone, was to monitor what was going on within the country of Iraq. So on August 31st, 1996, after Bill Clinton became president, uh, actually well into his uh, first term, uh, the Iraqi military launched its biggest offensive since 1991. It was against the city of Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan. So it was in the northern part of the country. And that was where we had feared that he was going to uh, reignite a genocidal campaign, kind of like 1988 with the chemical bomb of Halabja, and 1991 when he was uh, doing the strikes against the Kurdish people after Desert Storm. And here, five years later, we're going back to wondering um, if Saddam Hussein is going to be doing this again. And the United Nations Security Council had passed Resolution 688, and that had for, uh, forbade Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government from suppressing Iraq's ethnic minorities. So here we have this military operation launched by Iraq against the Kurds, and President Bill Clinton authorized missile strikes against uh, Iraq in retaliation and to monitor the no-fly zone and try to keep uh, UN Security Council Resolution 688 in, you know, enforced uh, at this time. About, was it December 1996, here is where we actually had a major policy shift in the Middle Eastern region. A major policy shift. And again, up until this point in time, it was keeping an eye on Saddam Hussein. As long as he's not expanding beyond his borders, he's in check, we're containing him, but we still have to keep an eye on him to make sure he's not repressing his own people. But then all of a sudden, we ended up bombing Iraq again. And this is by this time, we were getting United Nations special commissions, we were getting um, a closer look at weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological warfare, and this is when we started getting into uh, regime change. And so let's take a look at Operation Desert Fox, which was the bombing of Iran in, of Iraq in 
In 1998, there was no authorization for the use of military force in Iraq. There wasn't. Operation Desert Storm had ended. Operation Iraqi Freedom hasn't happened yet. This was not covered under anything. We didn't have a declaration of war like we did for World War II. President Clinton signed into law and pressed Congress for passage of H.R. 4655, which is called the Iraq Liberation Act. This appropriated funds to Iraqi opposition groups to push for regime change and kick Saddam Hussein out of power. <laughs> kind of like Iran-Contra, actually. Um, this is the act that President Clinton used to justify continued bombing in Iraq. Uh, the act, one of the things that said in this act was that nothing in this act shall be construed to authorize or otherwise speak to the use of the United States Armed Forces except in, as provided in Section 4A2 in carrying out this act. Section 4A2 states, quote, the president is authorized to direct the drawdown of defense articles from the stocks of the Department of Defense, defense services of the Department of Defense, and the military education and training for... Iraqi Democratic Opposition Organizations. H.R. 4655 is what really got us in trouble. This is where it started, October 31st, 1998. This is when it became a quagmire in the Middle East. And I'm saying this not to blame Bill Clinton for it. I'm saying this because this is what changed our policy from one of containment in the region to one of pushing for regime change and things that subsequently made matters much worse. That's what happened, Operation Desert Fox. That was part of our new world order. The new world order was starting to look an awful lot like the old world order. And then, just uh, three years, yeah, three years after that, yeah, three years after that, not even three years, something happened. We're going to show you video that's out there. It's available. It is probably one of the most hardest hitting videos I've ever seen on what happened on September 11th, 2001. We did edit the video down for two things, time and language, because you know, when, if you're out and about and something bad happens, what are the first words that come out of your mouth? Well, here in New York, profanity comes out. So we edited some of the profanity out. We tried to get as much of it out as possible. And this is not graphic footage. It's nothing that you haven't seen before. It's just what I appreciate about what I'm going to show you is the angle in which this was taken, because this was taken right then and there. It was not by a news crew. It was from somebody who lived in the neighborhood. And then to actually hear the real-time reaction to what was happening as things were happening. So let's take a look at uh, Steve Vigilante's uh, video from the World Trade Center attack on September 11, 2001. Look at, look at the hole! And you notice something? The flames are getting lower and lower, guy. Yep. They're, they're, they're slowly going down the building. That building looks like it took a major hit. It did. It's a plane. God damn it. That building's never going to be the same again. How did you... How do you bring that building down? I. You can't. You got to implode it. You can't even implode it. It's too high. You got to dismantle it from the top. This is unbelievable. This whole city is shut down. You 
you saw it happen, Harry? You heard it? What happened? Well, he was just like, I heard the thing that... Yeah. You think that was... Like, like, it sounded like it was right by the building, and some guy said it flew over right in front of the building. You think that was a terrorist? terrorist attack? No, I don't know. They have some guy on the phone who said it was either a 737 or an Airbus. He witnessed the whole thing. An Airbus? Yeah, and... No, an Airbus is too big. No, but the thing is, when I look out the window, the whole... There were planes shooting out. I saw that. I believe that I like them four, five, five. Push, push, better act. You better act today. You better act today. This president better act today. I'm telling you right now. You know what I'm saying, Steve? I don't know, man. Marines, whatever. Let's go. Yeah, but where? Where? They know exactly where. Well, because of Israel. So do you remember that? Do you remember how you were feeling on that day? What do you remember about that day? Sure, it was 16 years ago, or 15 and a half. That was another defining moment. Just like H.R. 4655, the Iraq Liberation Act, changed our look, or changed how we viewed Saddam Hussein and our focus on what was going on in Iraq, Getting hit on 
akin to the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941. That changed the way we viewed the rest of the region. That's when terrorism really became real on our own shores. And I didn't even include the Pentagon or Flight 9, United Flight 93 over Shanksville, Pennsylvania. I didn't even include that. I think everybody knows what happened on 9-11. This is what led to Operation Enduring Freedom. This is where we got involved in the war in Afghanistan. Just like H.R. 4655 gave us further war in Iraq, 9-11 gave us war in Afghanistan. Notice that our foreign policy in that region now was becoming uh, a two-headed snake. We had to fight back against two different snakes with one snake of our own. That's where we had to branch off. What was President George W. Bush's response to 9-11? Let's check it out. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very So we're just going to leave it really, really brief in the interest of time. Uh, it's amazing how much George W. Bush looks like his father. And I did forget to mention that uh, something else that did happen in uh, the mid-'90s under uh, President Bill Clinton was a series of embassy bombings when U.S. embassies uh, in, throughout the world were mercilessly bombed. And that was traced back, I believe, to Al-Qaeda, which was the organization that was responsible for the 9-11 attack. So Bill Clinton was also impacted by acts of terror, uh, just as much as George W. Bush was. So now we're going to, you know, we kicked off Operation Enduring Freedom to bring war against the Taliban in Afghanistan and try to get them to give us Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. Let's take a look. The United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. More than two weeks ago, I gave Taliban leaders a series of clear and specific demands. Close terrorist training camps, hand over leaders of the Al-Qaeda network, and return all foreign nationals, including American citizens, unjustly detained in your country. None of these demands were met as we strike military targets. We will also drop food, medicine, and supplies to the starving and suffering men and women and children of Afghanistan. The name of today's military operation is Enduring Freedom. We defend not only our precious freedoms, but also the freedom of people everywhere to live and raise their children free from fear.
I do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help me God. So help me God. I was once told by a commanding officer, it's not a question of if we go to combat. It's a question of when. And you have to ask yourself, will you be prepared? Always have people forward deployed. We're always ready to respond to a crisis around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Navy Marine Corps team is prepared to do what needs to be done. Uh, everything we have basically can come off and go ashore and get in the dirt. That tie with the Navy is very important, from the water to the ground. There's somebody out there, 365 days a year. It's a total team uh, effort, I call it. One team, one fight. That's what we bring to the table, Navy Marine Corps. When you say, send some light into combat, it's not some faceless robot. These are people, just like you. The Navy Marine Corps team allows us to project power ashore from international waters, drive 700 miles inland into Afghanistan. You can't do that with any other force. People who say that American kids are not tough have not seen my Marines in fighting holes at 3 o'clock in the morning. Their spirit and resolve. I think I'll stand in awe of that for the rest of my life. Someone has to do it. Uh, somebody brother, somebody's sister. They work 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day or more if you're doing combat in some cases. And they do a little smile on their face. They want to do stuff that's important for their country. My job is to defend my country and there's nothing I can say or do that would make me prouder than what I'm doing right now. I see the very best of them every day out here. I level hell out of all of them. Defeating the Taliban is what we went in there to do. We helped Afghanistan just the fact that we've hit a regime that was so oppressive, you know, and now they may have more freedoms. America has to have warriors that are willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice to keep this nation free and great. So even when you see the ships pull back in, there's still people out there ready to do the job if, uh, if need be. That's why I go to sea. Nobody's going to come over, tell my kids how to run their life or take their freedoms away. I'll be dead before that ever happens. own military career I remember a lot of these events. Uh, I enlisted in the Air Force Reserve. Uh, be, was in information management was my first career field. That was uh, 1996. That was before the Iraq Liberation Act was uh, passed. I believe that was... No, that was uh, before the uh, missile strike um, on, on Iraq. Um, the thing is I remember 9-11. I remember Operation Desert Fox. Operation Desert Fox happened a month after I had transferred from information management into public affairs. Then 9-11 happened and I was actually already slated for deployment. So by the time I got to Kuwait in uh, January of 2002, just a couple of months after 
uh, the 9-11 attack, well, I was already slated to go even before then to uh, support Operation Southern Watch. So I supported Operation Southern Watch and Operation Enduring Freedom. I remember these deployments like they were yesterday. We had to go to war. This was a, one of those rare times when America was united. Republican, Democrat, Libertarian for the most part, Green Party, uh, Constitution Party, everybody was pretty much on the same page. We were attacked. We need to bring the war to those who attacked us. That was the nature of Operation Enduring Freedom. And, of course, that required a lot of military personnel. We had more people who volunteered for duty. We had a lot of people who volunteered to go overseas, myself included. And so we're going to leave you with today with our music, uh, in music, um, the U.S. Air Force Band, Max Impact Band, Send Me. Dallas Pearson producer. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Reminding you we have 250 more, 254 more shopping days left until Christmas. With that, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Thank you.